All right, Micah chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 8. Micah chapter 3, and we'll read verse 8. The prophet Micah, as he is filled by the Spirit of the Lord to preach God's word to the people. And in order for the people to get convicted, to be empowered, to change their life for the Lord, Micah needs the Holy Spirit to fill his mouth and to anoint his tongue so that he can speak the words of God and the word of God can come inside people's lives and prick and convict and shatter and change their life. In order for Micah to do that, he needs to be filled. In verse 8, it says, But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, that's going to be the main focus of my message is the first part of verse 8. And I'm going to preach you a textual message examining <coughs> each point throughout these words. <coughs> in order for Micah to have authority, in order for the people to listen to him, it all comes down to the filling power of the Spirit. If you want your life to have authority over people, power to change people's lives, the Holy Spirit to manifest out of you in such a way where it can uh, lead people down to the right path, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not of your own. In order to be filled, the most covetous thing in Christians' lives today, where young preachers and young men have always wanted and strived and studied, and it is one of my things as well, is the filling power of the Holy Spirit. The filling power of the Holy Spirit is one of those covetous cases where people want to learn, want to know, and then they dig up and research great men of God in the past. How were they filled with the Holy Spirit of God? One of my favorite messages is to cover this topic about the filling of the Spirit. It's one of the most important things in your life that is absolutely transforming. Amen. It'll transform your life. It'll trans, uh, transform the household around you. It'll transform the people around you and even the lost world. And I hope that you can get this, get this strange, awesome, mysterious power of God and in order to receive it, it's by the simple steps of the Christian life. In order to be filled, are you truly filled? The title of my message today is All Into Full Throttle. Let's pray. Father God, put me into full throttle and you take the reins and you take control. And Father God, all I can do is come before you dust and ashes and completely give up myself to the leading power of your Holy Spirit. Take me and use me, Lord, and then I pray they will be manifested out of me that people will see it and they'll be convicted and life's changed. May it manifest itself, manifest itself in such a way that the flesh will take no glory and no control. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Let's look at the first part of that verse, but truly I am, but truly I am. Truly I am, the person himself or herself, is what takes for spiritual power. And that's the first point. The person for spiritual power. The person for spiritual power. You have to understand that in order for the Holy Spirit to work and to convict and change people's lives, God is looking for a person. It takes a person. It takes one man. It takes only one woman to surrender himself or herself to the power of the Lord. In order for God to manifest, to work miracles, to get prayers answered, to get people saved from the clutches of hell to the glories of heaven, it takes one man God is looking for. Are you that one man? We need people who surrender themselves to the filling power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit will have no work in this community. If you look at these other great persons... These great people back then, men of God who were Holy Spirit filled, who were so empowered, who had lives changed, who had souls saved, who had people transform themselves on the altar and come down and repent and get right with the Lord. I mean, so incredible when you look at these famous people. Look at D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody, who had thousands on the altar, thousands of souls saved, who had a way of preaching that was so powerful. But that man realized that in spite of his best preaching, it was nothing without the filling power of the Holy Spirit. An old woman went up to D.L. Moody and told him that I, I, I'm praying for you to be filled with the Spirit. 
Moody never understood that until later on and realized that he needed it every moment before he preached. Charles Finney, who was so famous to go inside literally uh, any community and he'll just have souls wan around him. He just goes in the middle of a factory, in the middle of a workplace, and then people will stop in the middle of their work and just hear the gospel preached from Charles Finney. They cannot help but be moved by the Holy Spirit moving outside of that man and just get saved. Why? Because Charles Finney preached so much about the filling power of the Holy Spirit. He made it a big deal. He said, Lord, I need to be filled with your spirit. Praying Hyde, who was so famous for answered prayers, he prayed so hard that it is reported that when he died, his heart literally moved from one location to a different location. Why? Because he just prayed so immensely, so passionately, so vividly and realistically with God that as if the presence of God fell upon him and that the famous Wilbur J. Chapman, famous preacher back then, would even contact Hyde and say, would you pray for me to get a revival? And when Hyde prayed for a Chapman to get a revival, Chapman got a revival meeting going within the first services. That's how powerful Hyde was. Why? Because he believed in the filling power of the Holy Spirit. And he prayed so much about that one. Billy Sunday, the famous baseball preacher that everybody ran around to see. The famous preacher who literally changed the whole country that they prohibited alcohol because of Billy Sunday's preaching. Liquor merchants hated that man. That man, how he was able to have such a powerful presence, he said, is because of the filling power of the Holy Spirit. And he prayed so much and delved into a deep relationship with God about the filling power of the Spirit. These people literally accumulated to millions of souls Amen. with prayers answered and miracles combined that you saw result after result after result. You wonder why the Great Awakening revivals came out. It's because of great men like these. The why? They realized the filling power of the Spirit was that important. And they surrendered themselves to that power. You don't believe it's that important after hearing that? If you don't think it's important to have the filling power of the Spirit, that's why you have no results. That's why you have no fruits. You have nothing of the power of God manifested out of your life. You might say, how do I get the filling power of God? These men did it. And they realized how important it was. Do you search for it? Do you realize how important it is? If you don't realize how important it is, let me tell you what. You think you're better than Moody? You think you're better than Finney? You think you're better than Hyde and Sunday? Charles Spurgeon blamed his members if he preached a rotten sermon and said, I know you all haven't been praying for me. And that's why his church, they would have a prayer meeting all the time before church started. Why? Because Spurgeon realized the filling power of the Holy Spirit. You don't think it's that important? These men thought it was important. These men thought it was important. Spurgeon thought so. Sunday thought so. Finney thought so. Moody thought so. And in Exodus chapter 31, verse 3, Bezalel thought so. For he was filled with the Spirit and was able to furnish the very house of God. Because why? He needed the filling power of the Spirit in order to even just furnish and build something. I don't see any of you, before you go to work, ask for the filling power of the Spirit. But Bezalel realized he needed God that much. I don't see people setting up the tech, realizing the filling power of the Spirit and depending on it. I don't realize people who get up on this pulpit and realizing the filling power of the Spirit is needed before they do their work for the Lord. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 25, Eldad and Medad were filled with the Spirit that they prophesied nonstop, nonstop. In Judges chapter 6, verse 33 through 34, Gideon himself was filled with the Spirit and was able to rouse a whole country to fight against a massive enemy. In Judges chapter 14, verse 6, Samson himself was filled with the Spirit that he tore a lion in half with just his bare hands. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, David himself was filled with the Spirit and henceforth was able to kill a giant and become a king himself. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit and Jesus called him the greatest man born among women. Amen. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, your Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, himself realized and was filled with the Spirit. Amen. And he performed miracles that his fame spread abroad, 
spread about throughout all the land. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the disciples were filled with the Spirit that they led 3,000 souls to salvation. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, Stephen was filled with the Spirit and was able to see Jesus in his glory. In Acts chapter 13, verse 9 through 12, Paul was filled with the Spirit and converted a chief official and many of the residents to salvation. Amen. I mean, these men realized that the Holy Spirit of God and that its filling was so important in their lives that they asked God, that they requested God, that they yielded to the filling power of the Spirit. And that's why they were able to produce these results. You have no result in your life. You have no fruit of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you don't realize how important it is for the Holy Spirit to use a person. Amen. One man. One man God needs. Do you realize that? You don't realize that, do you? That's why your house is a mess. That's the reason why your family life is about to throw in. That's the reason why the, your church is about to fold. That's the reason why you're not doing well in your work life and school life. You have no, no urgency, no attention to the filling power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what manifests and fills and uses you. But you're all going by flesh, aren't you? All flesh, everything. Everything I do when I preach out of this pulpit, when I lead, when I pastor, I have to do my effort, my thinking, my ability. It's so easy to think that way. You know, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, uh, where grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. You have to understand the Holy Spirit can be grieved. If the Holy Spirit can be grieved... He cannot fill. Yeah. He cannot grow out of you. Yeah. Galatians 5.17 makes it plain why. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary. The one to the other so that he cannot do the things that he would. Why can I get any soul saved so far, Pastor? You weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. You're filled with flesh. Why can I have been able to read all my memory verses and be able to quote them? Because you weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. You went by flesh. Why is it that we haven't been getting people into this church and growing it? Because you've been gone by the flesh. You weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is it that I prayed and prayed and then God has not answered the prayer? You are not filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's so important that you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that when you pray, when you preach, and when you talk to people and just your very action and demeanor out of you, the Holy Spirit can just work and invisibly move and magnetize the people's hearts and draw them in by the Holy Spirit power of God and get that fruit that you want. But it's all done because of that flesh. And that's the reason why it's so important that, well, I'm filled with the Spirit and I pray for it and I try to yield. Really? Or is it truly? Does the Holy Spirit truly fill you, the person? Really? Really? The Bible says the Holy Spirit can be grieved. That something fleshly can block and hinder the Spirit. Do you pray to the Lord? Do you really look at your life and say, God, I surrender this sin to you. Lord, I know I have this personality problem of mine. Lord, I, when's the last time that you've done that? Did you, when's the last time you check, carefully checked yourself and say, God, create within me a right spirit and cleanse me and help me to see and investigate. Search me, O oh God. Try my heart. When's the last time you've done that? Oh, I know I'm struggling with this problem and that sin problem and I can't get victory. Look, I'm not talking about these obvious sins. There's a sin that you don't know from your heart. Maybe the reason why you still mess up with those same sins is because there's a deeper sin that lied within your heart. Maybe because of your laziness. That's why you keep committing that sin. Maybe because of your selfishness. That's your real issue. Your pride. You only think about yourself. That's the reason why you keep going up and down and struggle with that sin. You know, I tried and I worked very hard to preach a great message and make it doctrinally right. And still, Pastor Kim critiques me and I make a mistake. Hey, maybe it's not because of your hardworking efforts. Maybe there's something in your heart you didn't really check. What is it? What is it? Do you really take time with his word? Or do you rush it when you prepare it? Maybe that's your issue. Maybe that's your fleshly issue. Maybe because of pride. I could... 
oh, I, I got a good idea and yeah, I'm going to wow them and I'm going to dazzle them. And yeah, maybe it's because of that little fleshly inkling of pride over there. And that's why the Lord can't make it such a wow moment in your teaching and preaching. Do you really investigate the flesh and say, God, what is hindering me? from preaching a great message, from actually pastoring this church well, from actually getting a soul saved. It may not be obvious sins, but it may be the underlying sins of your flesh that you have not surrendered, that you have not checked, that you have not prayed to the Lord. And that's what hindered the Holy Spirit from moving. Do you really check yourself? Do you really say, Lord, I mean, it's just a simple prayer. Simple prayer. All you have to do is say, God, I don't know myself. I don't know how wicked I am, how weak I am. Show it to me. Yeah. And will you take it and change it? Yeah, Do you even pray that? Or is it just like a checkmark list? Okay, God, I, I repent of this sin, that sin, that sin. I plead the blood. All right, done. Go to sleep. No wonder the Holy Spirit don't fill you. Yeah. That, that prayer time is not real with God. It's not centered on the person. The person. It's the person that falls on his knees and pray. Not just words out of the prayer like a magic word. It's the person that surrenders the heart. It's the person that surrenders the being to the very being of God in prayer. It's the person. It's the person that yields. It's the person where the word of God speaks out of its pages grabs a hold of your heart and changes you. I'm not saying it's just a book and it's not the book that changes you. It does. But you're the one blocking it, the flesh. So you're the problem. You. Undoubtedly, as Bob Jones Sr. said, undoubtedly the problem is you. Why can't the Holy Spirit fill you? You, the person, the person must yield to God. And then the Holy Spirit can make wonders out of your life. Why? You're, you're still clinging on to something. You're not letting go. There's something fleshly there that you refuse to let go. And it's not an obvious sin, but it's an inner sin. And maybe some of you are starting to see it now or know it now. Maybe some of you have never saw it before and you're starting to wake up. About time you open your eyes and see the fleshly issue. And finally, finally, let the Holy Spirit break that flesh and let it come out. You're holding on to that. That's the flesh clinging on. No. Uh, uh, no. 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 This is just a part of my life. I can't live without it. And what? Live without your flesh? You can't survive without your flesh? Your own fleshly desires? That's how much you need it? See, you don't need the Holy Spirit of God then. So the Holy Spirit of God don't need to fill you because you don't need it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 famous verse, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And how God can use person, a person. It takes one man, one woman, how God can be able to have the Holy Spirit manifest itself out is if that flesh breaks. If that flesh feels the pain and that flesh starts to crack and shatter and you feel like your life is shattering and you feel like it's so hurtful and God, I mean, why is this problem happening to me? Why do I have to put up with it? Why do I have to go through this trial? My friend, you're wasting a golden opportunity for the Holy Spirit to fill and use you. Did you hear what I just said? You're wasting a golden opportunity where the Lord says, it's about time I use you. It's about time that Holy Spirit fills and comes out. But in order for it to come out, we need to change this fleshly thing and we need to break this fleshly issue and you need this comfort in your flesh. It's just too comfortable, too comfortable. We need to get rid of that thing. Oh God, but yeah, yeah that's right, take it away. That's too comfortable for you. We need to get rid of that. Good. That way you can truly love me and not love the other person and love that thing and love that goal of yours. Love that desire. Let the love of Jesus truly 
fill out of your life and let's do that. Let's take away this comfort. And then suffering kicks in and you feel a little bit closer to the cross of Jesus Christ, what he felt as that nail hammers down, bang, and then God says, that goes down, and then bang, and then God says, that goes down, and then bang, and then your flesh feels it, and the blood spills out, and you go, God, through my brokenness, use a miracle. Amen. 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 But you know what you do? You're, you're too busy. You keep going, ah, and then you protect your arm. You say no, and you run away from that nail, digging deeper into your rotten, comfortable flesh. And then God says, then I cannot use you. Then I cannot fill you. You know what you should do in suffering? Don't complain. Start praising. Then the Holy Spirit fills you. You know what you should do during suffering? Not whining and crying. You should start praying. Then the Holy Spirit fills you. You know what you should do during suffering? Not try to run away and then try to find something worldly to satiate the flesh. No, you ought to be yielding to the Holy Spirit. Get on your knees and read that precious word of God. You know what you need to do during suffering? Not just give up and throw in the towel and then try to find things in life that satisfy and that urges your desire and it's all just fleshly. No, you, need, you know what you need to do? Drag yourself to church. Then Amen. you'll be filled with the Spirit. Amen. You know what you need during suffering? You, don't, you need to get away from that contemporary music garb, that wrong doctrine and everything wicked in this world and you need to start singing some hymns and praising Amen. the Lord. Amen. Then you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what you should be doing uh, during suffering? Not just uh, sleeping it away and drinking alcohol and uh, chasing away the desires and drowning it with sin. You know what you should be doing during suffering? You should be checking yourself and say, God, what are you trying to do in me? What should I surrender more to you? What should I check myself? What should I surrender more to your will? That's what you should be doing during suffering. Why? Because those are golden opportunities for God to change you. And you know what matured you? What changed you? Those levels of suffering. Those levels of crisis. And you know it was during those moments when you were on a pathway of two paths and you were at the middle, making a decision during suffering, and you said, I choose God. I don't choose self. I don't choose the world. I don't choose the devil. I choose God. And it was at that moment, your life transformed and changed, and you matured. And you know it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what that was? That was the Holy Spirit trying to fill you. And you let him in. So you know what you need to do during suffering? You need to let the Lord... Let that flesh suffer yeah. and let that flesh shatter and let that flesh just ooze and melt away and just vanish that the Holy Spirit light and presence can just manifest completely out of it and there's no flesh blocking it. Amen. Oh, what you're seeing right now is just flesh, but oh God, I pray that's not what you're seeing right now through your spiritual eyes. And that what you're seeing is a Holy Spirit filling power of God coming out of here. But that comes through suffering. Yeah. Amen. That's true. My second point is the position for spiritual power. The position for spiritual power. If you look at that verse, verse 8, full of power, it says. Full of power. The person is so important so that the Holy Spirit can move and change. But it's not just the person, it's the position as well. It's one thing for the person to yield to the Holy Spirit, but it's another thing where the person realizes his or her own position of spiritual power. Where am I at in my spiritual power? Can I honestly say that it's really incredible and that it's filling all over my life that people around me see it and that it's affecting other people's lives and changing their hearts? Can I honestly say that? Or is your spiritual power the very weak very low. Hardly people see it. You know, when uh, people talk to Tom Cho and they talk to him, do they really talk to Tom Cho and see him who he is as Tom Cho? Or do they sense and realize Jesus Christ is manifesting out of him? 
See, that's the thing. Is that, I mean, are you coming as you are, who you are? Or do they see Jesus Christ? Do they see the position of the Holy Spirit manifesting out of your heart that there's an awe, that there's a fear, that there's some sort of reverence and that the, their heart can't be just helped but be moved and attracted to your light when they talk to you. And you're the person that they depend upon for prayer. And they said, you know what, I, I know I'm going to ask you to pray for me. You're the one that they ask, I know that you can take care of the church. You take care of it for me. I know that you can preach. Take, preach. I know you're the one that can witness to that soul witness. Are you that light, that shining light that they plainly see? Or do they just see a normal Gene Kim? Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. What should be pretty obvious, how you can trust a certain person in his or her spiritual plane and the level of spiritual feeling that they're at, is by their testimony. That should be very obvious. Amen. How do you know that this person is going to preach a great sermon? Oh, I've seen him preach before. Great job preaching. How do you know that this person is going to teach a great teaching and not give something heretical? I've seen that person teach before. They're going to teach just right. Well, I know. How do you know that this person is going to be a great soul winner? I've seen that person witness as well. How do you know this person will be good to fellowship, to get along, to be close with, and that this person won't backbite, won't gossip, and this person won't be a problem to you later on, won't say weird stuff or be a burden. Oh, I've seen that person the way he or she talked to me before. I've seen that I've known him or her for all these years. You know what that is? Testimony. Testimony. What is your testimony like? Oh, just a few church attendances. Just a few hellos, that was it. Hardly the last time I'm praying for you and... You know, never went to any form of soul winning. You think that that's the, is that your position of your spiritual power right now? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit really that way? Is that your testimony? You know, it should be pretty obvious. We know that an athlete, he's filled with power for the 26-mile marathon. Why? When he faithfully practices. It's a faithful practice. Your spiritual power may be small right now, but let me tell you something. Don't you take those little things lightly, and that's your problem. Because you take those little things lightly, that's why the Holy Spirit can't fill you. Well, it's just attending church. It's just a soul winning class where I write notes. Yeah, it's those little things. Those little things. Those little things. The testimony that we see you all the time coming in those little things and the Holy Spirit, he's just amping you up and just using you and then filling you. And he's like, about time, I can use you. And that's why you can effectively sow and that's why you can effectively pray and that's why you can effectively lead a ministry. Why? Because those little things that you faithfully, faithfully, faithfully practice to just setting up the kitchen, to setting up the chairs, offering pickup drives, coming here early, doing your utmost best 100%, no matter how menial the task seems to be, you're going to say, I'm going to do a 1,000%, make it flawless and perfect and well. Even if it's just cleaning up a table or cleaning the toilet. It's that faithfulness and practice that God sees and says, I can use that person. And the spiritual power grows. Think about it. It's that faithful practice, 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 practice. Well, I messed up in soul winning. You practiced. I messed up in preaching. You practiced. And, well, I messed up in sin again. I don't think I can come to church. You practice. And when you practice, that's why the, God can use him. Think about it. This is common sense. How can a man have thousands saved without learning how to soul win? How can a man see thousands of God's miracles without prayer? How can a man convert thousands of people to become Bible believers without reading or knowing the Bible? How can a man bring thousands to a Bible-believing church without coming to church him or herself? Where's your position of your Holy Spirit power? Look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Keep your hand at Micah 3 because we're going to go back there. Look at Luke chapter 11. 
God is looking for a person. You, you're the person. Amen. You, are you looking at yourself? God is looking for you, a person to fill. But now God is looking at your position. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Well, I'm not doing much for the Lord. You faithfully practice. And that's how the Holy Spirit can fill you. You think that it's the Midas touch that Finney had that all of a sudden he just preaches an outstanding message without preaching so many times, without praying so many times, without practicing so many times, without reading his Bible so many times. How can he preach a great message? Because he read that book over and over, prayed over and over, preached over and over. You faithfully practice. Do you faithfully practice? No, it's just a one-time recording. Done. Preaching. I'm ready. You know what it is? Oh, I preached two, three times before. I'm done. I'm ready. Oh, I, you don't faithfully practice. 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 And say, and then let that testimony be manifested. And the person knows, oh, I know who's going to be the first person inside the church building, even though I'm late. I know, because that person was faithful, coming in 9.30 all the time, trying to set up stuff, opening the doors, and outside in the car waiting. Oh, I know so-and-so will be there. You know what that is? Faithfulness. Because that person practiced over and over again, without any credit, without any applause. Turn to Luke chapter 11 and verse 5. A very important passage about the filling power of the Spirit. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Yeah. Verse 13, If he then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? This is not saying that uh, you get the Holy Spirit and you have to pray to get the Holy Spirit. No, you already have the Holy Spirit in you. Once you're saved, you cannot lose the Holy Spirit, no matter how many times you sin. That verse says how much what? More. It's more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can grow? Yeah. It's called filling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit can more fill and more grow out of your life. But the problem with people today is that, well, I pray for the filling power of the Spirit, and it just never happened. You know what your problem is? You're at verse 5, and then you stop right there. You just say, friend, give me a couple loaves. And that's it. You're done. You know, you know what you need to do? You know what you need to do? At verse 7, if God says, no, not yet, I'm not going to give it to you now, you know what you need to do? Verse 8. You need to be verse 8. Friend, give me loaves again. Give me the loaves. And God says, no, not yet. Friend, give me the loaves. No, not yet. Friend, give me the loaves. And when God hears that over and over again, God says, okay, this guy wants a piece of bread that badly. If you want bread that badly, you Canaanite woman, you... Give me something to eat. Give me something to eat. And Jesus says, no, no, no. And the woman says, at least give me a crumb. And Jesus says, all right, here you go. N now get off my back and leave me alone. Yes, praise the Lord, I got a crumb. You know what your problem is? You're not desperate. Like that woman saying, God, I need the filling power of the Holy Spirit. And then, oh, I'm done with Wednesday night prayer meeting. We're done. Let's go home and uh, fill my flesh again and not fill my Holy Spirit. You know what you need to do? You need to not move, not budge, and you need to say, God, I am not moving. I am holding a protest right here and I'm going to sit right here and God, I'm not going to move. 
until you give me the filling power of your Holy Spirit. God's like, well, I don't know if you wanted that bad. Yes, Lord, I wanted that bad. Well, I don't know. You got this fleshly thing right here, here, here. God, I surrender it. Well, do you really surrender? I'm not too sure. God, yes, I wanted that bad. Give me the Holy Spirit. God's like, well, uh, not the right timing yet. I'm not too sure. You're not ready. God, I'm willing and I want to be ready. Make me ready, Lord. And God's like, well, and God gives a thousand excuses. What about this? What about that? And God wants to see if you're so desperate that you will overcome all these reasons that God says, what about this? What about that? What about this? And you say, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. God's like, might as well give it to you. But you're not desperate for souls to be saved in this community. You're not desperate for the seats to be filled in this church. You're not desperate for God to make use out of your life. You're not desperate. You know what you're desperate for? Brushing your teeth every day and going to bed and eating three meals a day. That's what you're desperate for. You're built to do that. Why? It's called flesh. You're, you're, not, you're not craving for the Holy Spirit that you're like, God, no, I need you. That's the thing about Charles Finney and some of these preachers when they started their ministries and say, God, I am not going to move until you give me the filling power of your Holy Spirit. They never got off. There are some cases of these preachers. They never, never got off their seat until they got it. Why? They desperately wanted it. Do you desperately want the Holy Spirit filling of God? And I mean desperation. I'll tell you what would make you desperate. I'll tell you what would make you desperate. If your loved one was about to die tomorrow and still lost, I know you'll be desperate to pray for that soul to get saved. And you're not going to budge and move. That's called desperation. I know what's going to make you desperate. When you're going through a suffering and trial and you need deliverance. You're not going to budge. You're going to fall on your knees and cry and pray to the Lord. You're going to mean it too when you pray. You're not going to just do a check mark list. You're just going to mean it when you pray this time. That's desperation. But we don't have a desperation for the filling power of the Holy Spirit. We lost it. We have a desperation for numbers and results and YouTube subscribers and views and uh, whatever pleases our flesh. We have no desperation for the Holy Spirit. You know, when we look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23 here, it's so sad that this is the sad state of mankind that when we do things every day, going to work, eating food, following our schedule, our own family duties, we got our own obligations, that we just go by the same old, same old. It's so easy to depend on our own ability to solve a crisis in the family. It is so easy to depend on our own ability when we go to the workplace it's to type in the right document and paper to fill out. It's so easy to depend upon your own ability to even drive and say it's just going to be common sense I get safely to work. So easy to depend on your own ability to walk, to breathe, and to eat, and to think. Why? It's called being normal in the flesh. And you're built into that kind of machinery that you forgot, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what your problem is? Your problem is that you don't renew yourself. You go by the same old same old every day. So wake up in the morning, go to work, you know, finish work, go through traffic, and then get home, eat my dinner. Same old, same old. God says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Yep. Do you renew yourself? Do you fresh, freshly consecrate yourself in the spirit? You know, it's so important that you, you yield to the filling of the Holy Spirit and when you yield, you need to be completely yielding to the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't know how to do that. Then it's simple. You freshly consecrate yourself to God. 
And that is your problem. What's consecration? Consecration is to check and empty everything of your flesh and surrender to the Lord and, and to admit to the Father, God, of myself I am nothing. I can't even breathe a lick well. Look at this world. They can't even breathe right. <coughs> they can't even breathe right. Do you realize that's how pathetic you are? You don't realize. You got too much pride in you, man. You don't realize how weak and pathetic you are. You can't even breathe right. And that's why you need to say, Father God, I come before you. I can't do a... Si you know what I do in the morning? God, I cannot do a single thing in my schedule without you today. Yeah. God, uh, with every phone call, I cannot make the conversation right. Father God, I, when I even have a relationship with my own family, I can't even do it right. Father God, it's all on you. All on you. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to follow your biblical principle. But God, know this, that I am nothing without you and it's all on you. And you need to help me. And I completely rely. I completely depend on you. And whatever mistake that my flesh makes, I'm going to rely and depend on Romans 8, 28. God, it's all on you. Amen. And you know what? He starts to use you a little bit then you'll probably see those answers to prayers you never saw before and those results that you never saw before. You know why? You don't yield to God. You don't depend on Him. You freshly consecrate yourself. Billy Sunday, when it was known that before he went to preach on the pulpit, he posted Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1 on his pulpit. You might say, why? Because it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach. You know what that means? Goes up there and it's not his sliding the bases or his dramatic illustrations or his yelling or his ripping of his outer garments where he would try to dramatize and get the show and the, the preaching results. No, it's the Holy Spirit. And, he's, and before he preaches his message, he reminds himself, okay, God, all you, not me. You know, it's not just starting out the morning that way. It's... Before you even drive, Lord, help me. Simple prayer. It's so simple. Before you preach, all you, Father, not me. I can even forget my good ideas at this moment. I, I know who I am, Father. I know who I am and I know who you are. I'm nothing. I'm weak. I'm frail. You're all powerful. This is your sermon, God. This is your teaching. Amen. Do you consecrate yourself to him? No, you don't. That's why God don't fill you. Why? You're too much of Gene Kim, Gene Kim, Gene Kim when you preach and teach. My third point is the principle for spiritual power. The principle for spiritual power. It says, by the Spirit of the Lord. That's the bottom line for the spiritual power. An unbreakable principle is what? The spirit, of lo the spirit of the Lord. Unbreakable. All-powerful, all-knowing. Mighty. And it still changes lives today. Do you yield to the... Do you realize it is the Spirit of the Lord that uses you? And it's not all the verses that you memorized and all the doctrines that you wrote carefully in your notes and... It's not all the time that you work so hard and you practiced and you're, you're smart in this and that. It's not your talent of speech, but rather it's all from the Spirit of the Lord. Who gave you your mouth? Who gave you your talent? Who made those brain processes to run and to connect the right dots and process the right words? Huh? You wouldn't even be able to function without the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Amen. You know how God exalts you? Lifts you up higher? I want that, Father! Then humble yourself. Cast all of it on Him. But when that little flesh of yours takes a little bit of credit for itself, and that Holy Spirit cannot fully move and, move and fill within you. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, I can't put you up here. I've got to put you down here. You want the Holy Spirit to fill you? Then it's when all the credit goes to Him. 
Yeah. When's the last time after you preached a great sermon and a great teaching, you spent some time with the Lord and said, Father, you know who that was. That was all you. Yes. I know that the people thank me for this, and I didn't pretend to be humble and say, oh, no, give God the praise and something like that. I, I accepted it, but, Lord, you know between me and you. Praise the Lord. That's all you. Praise thank God. you, Father, for filling me and using me. And God's like, well, about time somebody thanked me after all these years. All these preacher big shots, they preach messages. They never thanked me one time. About time somebody thanked me. About somebody realize that he needs me to preach for him. When's the last time that you gave credit to the Lord? When's the last time that instead of saying, Lord, give me this, give me, give me, give me, give me. When's the last time you said, God, you're an awesome God. Yeah. God, God, Lord God, God's bow down before you. I mean, this, the, 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 the most powerful elite system cannot shackle your invisible church. Without all these, we don't need these physical resources. You're such a great God. And then why do you think then the Lord will keep putting miracles in this church then, huh? Because somebody or some people know it's all this invisible hand moving and giving him the credit for it. Do you realize the principle of your spiritual power? When's the last time that you realized that? Luke chapter 11, verse 9 through 10, it says... I say unto you, it's the same passage we read, but it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. The Bible says, Doors to great things. Are open, And this is in context of the filling power of the Holy Spirit at Luke 11. Doors to great things are opened if you seek for it and you do them to begin with. But that's the thing. You know why I believe a lot of people aren't doing great spiritual things for the Lord? They're not looking for it. That's, that's the problem. You just go by, well, you know, I'm just content to be a regular church Joe and that's it. No, that's not how you do it. You don't become just a regular church nobody. What you do is, Lord, I want to seek and find something, what we can do to build this church greater. What I can do to be a better blessing to somebody else, to sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so. Lord, I want to do something that will help financially. Lord, I want to uh, do something. If you look for great things, then the Lord will give you great things. But nobody's looking for great things. You know what they're looking for? They're looking at, oh, the world's so wicked. Nobody listens to me. No one's going to get saved. What's the point of street preaching? No one listens to me anyway. That's why we don't do street preaching anymore. And what's the big deal about this? And what's the big, that's your problem. You're not looking at great things. You just keep looking at closed doors, closed doors. You want closed doors? God will close the doors then. You want open doors? You look for it. And then you find it. And then you knock. And God pound your fist at the door of heaven and let him open up something great in your life. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Why do you think we went online? Oh, just looking at open doors. Isn't it as simple as that? It was that simple. Just simple as that. That's why the Lord blessed us immensely online when God could have used so many other pastors, teachers, and churches. What did I do? Some secret, deep thing? No, just look at an open door. Take it. Open doors to why people would uh, watch these videos, right? Look at these open doors to why people would come to our church, right? Look at these open doors to why people got convicted and blessed from the teaching and preaching. You look for open doors. Yes. You don't just go, oh, you know, that's it. Let me ask you a question, all right? A very simple question, but it's so deep you never thought of it before. Who's the who are the closest people in all of this Bay Area and Silicon Valley? Who are the closest people to the filling of the Spirit? Ever thought of that before? 
Who are the people closest to it? You, aren't you? Why? You know too much truth. You know too much stuff. God has given you great opportunities. You're in a Bible-believing church. People don't... Uh, pe you are rescued from a lot of wrong doctrine. You got so many things that the Lord has opened up in soul winning, visitation, street preaching, fellowship, and then growing your own spiritual walk. You're the closest one out of everybody out here. Who has such a chance like you? But man, if you are the ones that are closest to the filling power of the Spirit, and your filling power is that small, no wonder Bay Area is going to hell. No wonder Silicon Valley is going to welcome in the Antichrist. Why? You! You are the one. <laughs> the gospel. You're the problem. You're the reason why the Holy Spirit don't fill this place. Why? Because if you're the closest ones to the filling of the Spirit, what do you think these lost sinners are going to do? Get closer to the Spirit than you? You're the closest. That's, That's why. If everyone in the world is weaker than me for the filling of the Spirit, I must be the one to do more than everyone here in this community to be filled with the Spirit. If no one in this world would read the Bible to get the full power of the Spirit, then I will. If no one here is going to pray to get the full power of the Spirit, then I will. If no one here is going to study and adhere to Bible-believing truth, to get the full power of the Holy Spirit, then I will. If no one here is going to come to a Bible-believing church and grow and be a blessing to people, then I will. If no one here in this area is going to concentrate on trying to be a blessing to people rather than being a burden, then I will. If no one here is going to ask desperately and yield to the filling power of the Holy Spirit, then I will. If no one here in this Bay Area will surrender their sin to get the full power of the Holy Spirit, then I will. If no one here is willing to lay down their life for Jesus to get the full power of the Holy Spirit, then I will. If no one here is willing to go through suffering and lay down their flesh, their rotten flesh, and consecrate themselves to get the full power of the Spirit, then I will. I will do it. And it takes one person. One person. And God says, that's enough. And he fills the power of his Holy Spirit. But that's the problem. We don't even have one. Not even one. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Will you be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and change this community? Do you want to see souls saved? Do you want to see seats filled? Do you want to see something big happen in this community? We need people to surrender to the filling power of the Holy Spirit and say, here am I, Lord. There's something in your flesh that you're holding on to and you're not willing for God to break and hammer and shatter. There's something in there of that pride, that ego, that selfishness that needs to be all on the altar. There's something in there that you're not desperate. You don't want the Holy Spirit. Let him leave your family. Let them go to hell. Let the Holy Spirit leave this Bay Area. Let them go to hell. Let the Holy Spirit even leave this church, his working and his power and not change and convict people's lives. Why? Because you don't care. You're not desperate. Let him leave then. Let Jesus leave our church, San Jose Bible Baptist Church, and not work because we just don't care. We're not desperate for it. We don't want him. Do you want a great blowout? Do you want a great blowout? Do you want a great blowout coming where God can bring a big revival meeting to our church real soon? Are you desperate for it? Do you pray for it? Do you want it? Or you just don't care? Maybe you're concentrating too much of yourself to create a good revival meeting, huh? You're great ideas. You don't depend on God. You don't desperately need Him. Because you've done a good job so far in preach and teach and soul winning and getting your family together and getting along with people in the church and helping out the pastor. You're just too good. So you don't need the filling power of the Spirit. Good job. You will get no power of the Holy Spirit, let alone the Holy Spirit use you, if you're not even saved. 
I would like to ask you this question. Please answer honestly. Answer honestly. If you were to die right now, are you 100% sure you would go to heaven? Are you even 100% sure? If you're not sure, then you're going to go straight to hell for your sin. But God doesn't want you to burn in hell. He wants you to get saved. He wants you to get saved. To be saved is so simple. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so His blood can wash away your sin. You've heard that story a billion times, but you don't really know what it means. Why did He die? Do you know why He had to do that? Because remember, your sin, your sin is the reason you go to hell, right? Your sin. It's you're the problem. You're the problem, remember. The only thing that can wipe that slate clean, every sin you've done, is the blood of Jesus. That's why he died. So all you have to do, it's so simple, all you have to do is when you repent as a sinner, just tell him, God, I believe, I believe what you did on the cross is enough to take me to heaven. It's that simple. You can say it right now before it's too late. If you don't know how to pray it, I'll give you the words on how to say it. You can repeat after me. You can say it this way, and you don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it to yourself. We're not going to point out who you are. It's so easy to get saved. Why not get saved today? Just say it this way and mean it. Dear God, I repent. As a sinner, I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected, so his blood can wash away my sin. I only trust in that to save me. Not my good works. Not anything I do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. With every head bow and every eye shut, one last time, this will be my last prayer. I'm done. Thank you for your patience. I'm done now. If any of you just repeated those words, uh, if this is, if any of you repeated those words, could you slip up your hand just real briefly, real quick? Did any of you just uh, ask the Lord to save you just now? All right. All right. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. I hope that everyone is saved today. All right. Don't burn in hell. We don't want you to go to hell. We want you to go to heaven. God, my Father, as I close this service in prayer, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray that we have surrendered to the filling power of your spirit. God, we're weak, we're frail, we're wicked. We know who we are. God, I'm, I can't pastor this church. Uh, I can't. I need you. It's only by your mercy and grace. It's such a miracle how, what you've done in my life and in this church. May these people be in awe through your majesty, through your power, how you used my life and this church where we didn't have all the physical resources. It's just you. May they understand a bit more of how great and mighty you are and that they will ask your filling. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.